Please turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 23 this morning. Please turn to Matthew chapter 23. Last Sunday we looked at the first part of Matthew chapter 23 in which Christ dealt with the Pharisees as a group. He spoke about the problems that were inherent in how the Pharisees were uh, conducting themselves, and he uh, gave specific challenges or judgments for them with a sequence of woes that he uttered in the latter part of Matthew 23. When you come to the end of that description of the Pharisees, we come to the text that we have for us this morning. This morning we're going to be looking at the last verses of Matthew chapter 23, verses 34 down through verse 39. As we look at verses 34 through 39, we see Christ now changing his focus in terms of how he is speaking. As he has spoken to the disciples and told them to watch out for the Pharisees and these woes and judgments that were going to be coming against them, he now speaks to the Pharisees as representative um, of the uh, leadership of the children of Israel at this particular time. And he talks about how he is going to be sending more speakers, more prophets, witnesses, testimonies that are going to be coming and presenting. And then he, he tells, tells us in the first verses about what's going to happen, about what they're going to do to his messengers that he's going to set, send. excuse me, And then in verses 37 to verse 39, Christ speaks about his compassion that he has. And when we get to these verses, I would like for us to focus on the tremendous compassion, the desire on the heart of God for his children at this particular time as, as Christ speaks about how uh, almost longingly, just I wish that your response had been different. Uh, you can see the desire that's on God's heart as we look at these particular verses as well. So this morning we're going to be looking at verses 34 down through verse uh, 39. We're also going to be looking over in the book of Romans at some verses that Paul has to share. As we look at these verses, there's also an underlying theological question that we're going to be addressing at least in some sense as we go through the text today. And that is that when we look at these verses today, we can see that there's a call of God that's extended. We can see this reference down in verse 37 um, in terms of the response of the people. And yet we also can see as we look in scripture that God has a purpose behind how this is all working out. And uh, the, later, the verses we'll look at in the book of Romans are going to help us see that side of things as well. And this theological observation that we're going to be at least considering today is in one sense the call of God and the will of man, and in the other sense the will of God in terms of what he is affecting or accomplishing, and why God, how God is in control of what's taking place. We can see here with God's plan that he is going to send messengers, and this is what's going to happen to them, that the messengers Christ sends, God sends, are not going to be well received. And we can see in the book of Acts what takes place with the Apostle Paul as he goes from city to city and how he is just routinely after city after city, he is rejected and he is persecuted and they, are, they try to kill him and he goes on to the next city and the scene repeats itself in city after city through the book of Acts. And so as we look at that, we can certainly see how what Christ is saying is going to take place here in verse 34 that it works itself out. We can see it very clearly in the book of Acts. And yet, as Paul tells us in Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11, this was all part of God's plan. And so the theological question or the tension that we see is both the call of God, the desire of God for people to respond to his message, and yet on the other hand, how God is supernaturally in control of what's taking place to accomplish his purpose. And we can see both of these working themselves out here. We'll begin by looking then at verses 34 through verse 36. In verse 34, Jesus says, after he's given these descriptions, the critiques of the Pharisees, the religious leaders, we see Jesus then speaking and saying, Therefore, behold, I am sending to you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, 
and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, so that upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. So Jesus is here speaking to the group represented by the Pharisees, the leadership. He's speaking to the children of Israel, saying, this is what's going to be happening. And when, even when Jesus is talking about how you're going to uh, persecute them from city to city, think about how the Apostle Paul was on his way from Jerusalem as he there saw the Lord, as the Lord appeared to him, and he had the message and he had the instruction that he was supposed to imprison the Christians that he found in that other city. And so we can see in the book of Acts fulfillment of what's spoken about here in terms of persecution that was going to take place. And yet in verse 35 it says, so that upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous. And we can see here this, this theological issue that is all part of the text today where we can see that God has a purpose in terms of what's being allowed and yet there's also culpability. There's also this sense of rejection that we can see in the next verses. I'll let you go on though. We can see that Jesus is first speaking about how there's going to be judgment that's going to be brought against them and they are held accountable for those that they have persecuted and killed as they have in the past. Think back to the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, God sent his different prophets, the, what we know as the major and the minor prophets. Not that it's like the baseball teams, the major leagues and the minor leagues. It's not that sense where we might think, well, these are the big guys and these are the guys that the farm teams, they haven't quite made it yet. It's not that sense at all. But it's in the Old Testament, it's the sense of the larger in size versus the smaller in size. And certainly the book of Isaiah or Jeremiah or Ezekiel have a great deal more to them than the book of Malachi or Micah or Haggai. And so the minor prophets, it's not to diminish the testimony of the prophet at all, but only the fact that their words, what they are saying, is shorter and briefer. And as God sent his messengers to Jerusalem, as God sent his messengers, uh, Gary, could you take that cord and just hook it up there so it doesn't distract everybody? Everyone's wondering what's clicking and it's the cord that's caught. It's, it's, it's beating against the windowsill over there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Jesus is saying that as you have persecuted and killed all these prophets, and you look at the example of Elijah and Elisha, and you look at the other prophets, the writing prophets, we can see that there's rejection over and over and over again. And so we can see that all through the history of God dealing with his people and wanting to draw them to himself, that there's a rejection of messenger after messenger after messenger that's sent to them, as we can see that here in these verses. So in verse 37 now, we have Jerusalem we have, excuse me, we have Jesus changing his focus and speaking to and of the city of Jerusalem as representative of the people. And look at the compassion, look at the love that we can see here in Christ's desire for the people. This is representative of God's desire for his people. God cares for the children of Israel. He's already said, this is what you're going to do to the messengers. You've already been doing it in the past and you're going to kill and you're going to uh, persecute the other messengers that I'm going to send you, which we see in the book of Acts, but this is my heart. This is my desire for you. Verse 37, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together, the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. And there we can see the desire of God and the resistant heart of rebellious man. God says, I wanted to draw you. I wanted to collect you. I wanted to give nurture and care. I wanted to protect you like a mother hen protects her little chicks. I wanted to do that with you. And you killed the prophets. You killed those that were sent to you. Even as he had said in the previous verse, it's going to happen now. 
And then the next verse, verse 39. For I say to you, from now on you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Jesus now gives this statement, this in, uh, uh, instruction saying, this is what's going to happen until you're ready to welcome me in the name of the Lord. Your house is going to be left desolate. For I say from now on, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes. And so here we can see a lot, there's a lot of theology in these verses of what takes place. On the one hand, there's the, uh, back in the earlier verses, that so that on you can fall the guilt of all these persecutions. Then there's also the desire of God, how I would have drawn you to myself. I loved you. I wanted to protect you. I wanted you to respond correctly. The lack of willingness, the end of verse 37, but you would not. And then there's the judgment that comes because of that. I say now, this is what's going to happen. Now, initially I had planned on including both these verses together with getting into the next chapter. And in the next chapter, we can see Christ gives a whole description, a number of descriptions about judgments that are coming in the future. And as I worked with the passages and tried to figure out how I was going to put it together, I, I decided I really need to just separate the two chapters. And we'll look at the judgments that come next week. I thought I would today, but we're going to have to postpone that. Because I wanted to look at the different theological issues that are taking place here where you have these different tensions. Now, I have used an example and an illustration for you before, and I want to go back to that illustration again. And it involves some math. And in math, one of the things that you do, at least in high school math, is that you have to plot lines on graphs. And you have different equations that you have to figure out and solve. And as you solve the equations, you can get one point on a graph and then another point on a graph. Then you have to connect the lines and you end up with a line that gets drawn. Now, the higher you up get in math, the lines don't stay straight. They get curved and they go different directions. And the higher the math, the curves do all sorts of weird things. But we, are, we only can plot as many points in scripture as God has chosen to give us. Those are the set points. And the way we have been wired, the way you've been wired, and I, we, we want to figure things out. We all, we want to know why does it work that way? And mankind through time has had different ways of solving and answering questions. We think that we're modern people and today we follow principles of physics and engineering and all those things today. But you know, cultures across the world have also tried to figure things out. And if the chief of the tribe gets sick at exactly the same time that all of a sudden there's a solar eclipse, then they're trying to figure out, is there a relationship between this eclipse and the chief getting sick? Because they're trying to figure it out, just like you and me. They have different things they use, different tools, different observations, but they're always trying to figure things out. So cultures through time have tried to figure things out. They've come up with their answers and reasons. We come up with ours today, but it's just inherent in the ways our minds work. We want to figure things out. So if we look at two tri truths in scripture and one truth seems to contradict another one, it causes us to have a dissonance inside. And we try to figure out, okay, well that seems to contradict this over here. But all God has chosen to give us are the words that are in our Bibles. Well, the words that are in our Bibles and the specific statements are those lines, those points that plot the line. And we can have a couple of different points or three maybe all in a row and they show that the line's going in this direction. And then we might have a different teaching of scripture. On the one hand, we might be talking about, well, what is man's choice? How does man's choice come into the picture in terms of what happens, whether a person gets saved or not? This verse 37 is, I would have gathered you under my wings, but you would not. You were unwilling. There was a matter of the will. And so we try to resolve, well, how much does a man's will and choice enter into the picture of what his ultimate destiny is? And so we see the, what Scripture says in these verses and others. Well, we see a line that goes a certain direction. And then we see other verses that talk about, well, God ordained it. Look back there at verse, verse 35. So that upon you might fall the guilt of all the righteous blood. And there's 
It's like their actions of what they did to reject the messengers is so that, so that they would be guilty. And we look at other passages that talk about what God was doing, and we'll see some of that in Romans 9 and 10 and 11. But we can see that those plot out like a different line. And what we have is that we can see this line, if you can see my hand here, that's one line that's a couple of different scriptures all point in that line. And then we see some other verses, and they have a different line, and it comes sort of like that. And now what does it look like is going to happen? It looks like if these lines continue, they're going to meet out here someplace. The problem, however, is that <coughs> what God has done is that he has put a dark piece of paper over what we, where we imagine the junction points of those two lines will be. And so we only have what he's chosen to give us. But because our minds try to figure out how it all works together, we assume, oh, well, those lines are going to meet at this particular point up here because that's what it looks like based on what he's chosen to reveal to us. But as those of you that have had more math than some others, you know that lines don't always go in straight lines. And sometimes lines go straight and then zoop, and they go up at an angle like that, or they go down, or they, whatever they happen to do. And the problem is that God has not chosen to reveal how that works out. It's hidden from us. And so when we deal with the issues that are in the text today, it talks about both what God's purposing to do and how man's will fits into the picture. We can only, we sort of draw a conclusion, well, I think that those lines are going to hit here. I think that that's how God has it all worked out. Now, this is what I know from you as a congregation. I already know that some of you are biased to think, well, I think those verses line up and it kind of works out this way. And I know some of you others think, well, I know, and I kind of think the lines work out this way. Now, the point is, both of us, both sides, whatever the sides happen to be, have different ways of looking at those verses and drawing conclusions. The text today, as we look at these verses, I want you to focus here in verse 37 that this is God's desire. Jesus is saying to the children of Israel, he said, I wanted, I wanted to draw you. I, I wanted to gather your children together the way a, a hen check, uh, gathers her chicks together under her wings, and you were unwilling. And we can see here that the mind, the will, the heart, the desire of God was for his people to respond with repentance and to acknowledge Christ for who he was. And that's clearly part of what's being said right here in this particular passage. Now, look at the heart's desire that Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, this is what I wanted to do. Now, with me, now turn with me to Romans chapter 9, please. We're going to read the first few verses of Romans chapter 9. And in these verses, I believe you'll see that Paul has the same heart, the same burden, the same desire that Jesus communicates here in Matthew 23. Look at what Paul says here in Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, verse 1, Paul writes, I am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and increasing grief in my heart for I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption as sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple, whose are the fathers, uh, verse 5, and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is over all God blessed forever. Well, you read those verses of Paul in verse, verse 1 and 2, and three, and Paul says, I wish that I could be cursed just for the sake of calling my brethren, my, my fellow Israelites, to Christ. And you can see the desire that Paul has. It's, it, it, to me, it, has a, it seems to beat with the same heartbeat that Christ had when he said, how often I would have gathered you under my wings if I could have. You go over to chapter 10. Look here at the first verse. Paul writes, brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer for, to God for them is for their salvation. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. 
But if you look at that first verse, again, Paul is communicating, this is my heart. It's like Paul is bleeding on pen on paper here in terms of what he's saying. This is what my desire is for my people. And so as Christ communicates it here as he's talking about judgment that's coming and about what's going to happen in the future when he sends the apostles and the missionaries and the, the believers that trusted Christ as the Messiah, he's talking about that where he says that you're going to kill them, you're going to crucify, you're going to scourge them, they're going to, you're going to persecute them from city to city. And here, this is what I wanted to do. And Paul has that, that same burden, that same heartbeat that he, that he shares, that he communicates. Now, as we look at this desire that Paul has to share and communicate, we also can see that Paul then goes on and he talks about God's sovereignty and how God is in control of what's taking place. And he's, God has a reason behind it. Uh, going, on, going back to Romans chapter 9, in chapter 9, verses 14 through 18, Paul speaks about Pharaoh. We talked about Pharaoh a month or two ago when we were looking at those early chapters of the book of Exodus and about how we could see there how the, the Pharaoh made a decision to reject the God of the children of Israel and he would not let the people go. Well, here we find in Romans 9, 14, what shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has the mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then he has mercy on whom he desires and he hardens whom he desires. You see, Paul is talking about reflecting on what took place back there with Pharaoh at, at this particular time. And when God worked, Pharaoh evidenced what his will, what his mind will, when he chose to reject Moses' first uh, request for the children to be allowed to go. And again and again, he hardens his own heart and he rejects it. And then we reach a certain point whereby we see God is hardening Pharaoh's heart and the successive uh, judgments and the, the plagues that are, are brought forth. And going on in chapter 9, though, chapter 9, verse 22. What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much pace, patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? This is interesting. Here, it's like Paul is reflecting upon God as though God was thinking, of, what if God... In, in his desire to make how his power, his love, his majesty, his, his grace, evidence, he put up with, he endured for a while uh, this, these vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. Verse 23, and he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon his vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. So here we find Paul describing God as putting up with, with wrath, rebellion, and attitudes of men. He, he could have judged them. He could have killed them. He could have instantly brought judgment on them. But instead, he wanted people to understand his great mercy and his great grace and his great love. And so God allowed this to happen because of his great love, his great mercy that he had. And then he goes on, uh, verse 25, as he says also in Hosea, I will call those who were not my people, my people, and her who was not beloved, beloved. And it shall be on them, excuse me, and it shall be that in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. And Paul reflects on the words of, of the prophets and he says, this is happening now. This is finding fulfillment now. As God allowed this to happen with Pharaoh and use Pharaoh for his purpose back in the Old Testament times, God is even now, even though Paul says, my heart's desire is for Israel, God has a purpose of using this so that by this, their persecution of the messengers as they are scourged, as they are crucified, as they are killed, that God will use that as a means for the gospel to now spread 
to the people that were known, that were at one time not part of God's people. They were not the children of God. You look in the Old Testament, there was one clear, specific people of God, the children of Israel. There were lots of other nations all around them, but it was God dealt with his people. But now it's changing. And Paul is marveling at this, that God's purpose is so that now those people that were at one time not part of the people of God might become the children of God. And can just imagine Paul trying to contemplate the wisdom of God and of how this all works out. I'd like to suggest with you that in my illustration with the graph and with the dark piece of paper that covers things, that it's as though Paul is reflecting upon these lines and he's reflecting on, oh, the majesty, the wisdom of God. I mean, this goes beyond what humans would think or put together. God was doing this to demonstrate his great power and love as a means by which now, with the rejection on the part of his people, the gospel would go to the Gentiles, that they would hear the gospel. So we can see that here in chapter 9. Now I'd like you to turn over to chapter 11, please, Romans chapter 11. Paul's still processing this in these chapters in Romans, chapter 11, verse 7. Paul's reflecting now on Israel. He writes, what then? What Israel is seeking it has not obtained, but those who were chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened, just as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not, ears to hear not, down to this very day. And David said, let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened to see not and bend their backs forever. Paul here, as he reflects on this, he's reflecting on the fact that God allowed this spirit of stupor, God permitted this to happen for his purpose. We go down later and Paul speaks to this again, verse 25. For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, just as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion, and he'll remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. And Paul here reflects upon what God is going to do, that ultimately God is going to Though he uses the rejection on the part of the children of Israel as a means then for the gospel to be bounced to, to be spread to the Gentiles, they're not, the Israelites, the Jews, are not on God's plan. God has a purpose. God has a plan. I would speak now from the side the fact that there are believers and Christians that think that God is totally done with the children of Israel. That when they rejected, when Christ made this pronouncement back in Matthew 23, saying that you are now judged and this is the end. That is not the end. We can see fulfillment. We can see it in Paul's writings. We can see it in the Old Testament prophecies that talk about this. It's spoken of in terms of a remnant uh, back in chapter 9, verse 27, a remnant that would be saved. And, and then ultimately then it's all Israel. I mean, there's going to be more that are going to be saved ultimately at some particular point. What we can see here, though, is that there are a couple different threads and a couple things happening. On the one hand, we have the will of the children of Israel, represented by the leaders that are spoken against as Christ speaks to the Pharisees. And he says, this is what you're going to be doing to my messengers that I send. We see a, a willful rejection, but we also see that willful rejection somehow factoring in, working into God's plan. But in that verse in Matthew 23 where Jesus says, how often I would have gathered you, but you would not. We can see that the resistance on the part of the children of Israel gives every evidence of resisting the purpose and plan of God in terms of, I wanted you to be saved. Let me throw another passage out to consider along the same lines. Uh, Peter speaks in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, that the will of God, the desire of God, was that all should be saved. And that there's the desire that God has a purpose and plan, why God holds off for some of his judgment, because God has a desire. And we can see that God has a desire that 
all would be saved. God has a desire that Jerusalem and Israel would respond. We certainly can see in the book of Deuteronomy and the books of the Old Testament where God's call and appeal to his people is to come to repent, to turn back to him, to turn from their idols, put their faith and trust completely in him, and certainly to accept his son, the Messiah, when he is sent. We can see that through the pages of scripture. And yet also God is somehow using that as he is in control and he has a purpose, as Paul talks about in these uh, chapters in Romans. And so the challenge that I would give to you today is to hear and heed the call. There are some that might think, well, I must wait until God finally moves or works in this situation. Watch out for that kind of an attitude. When the call of God is extended, when God calls, one should respond. The children of Israel were culpable, they were responsible because they did not receive Christ as the Messiah. Children of God, children of the church, the messengers, the apostles, the missionaries, they were crucified, they were persecuted, they were chased from city to city, even as their, the attackers would follow them from place to place once they realized where they had gone. We can see that in the book of Acts. But the challenge is that we must heed the call. We must heed the call. And for those of us that would recognize the verses that give the definition for one of the lines that talks about God's sovereignty, we have to recognize that there is a factor that somehow behind the dark page, somehow there's a way that that will of man is involved. And however it works out, and we'll find out someday as if God chooses to reveal it to us, we have to recognize both God's sovereignty and also the will of man, how they work together. And the challenge I would have to those that have never trusted in Christ is heed the call of God during the day of grace and the moment of opportunity. And do whatever you can to share the gospel with people. Don't be worried about, is this person the elect or not? Is this part of God's will? Has God chosen this person as a vessel of wrath or a vessel of mercy? What is God doing? Don't worry about that. Worry about getting the gospel to the person. Let God work in the person's heart. Encourage the person to respond to Christ as his or her savior. And if you never have responded, recognize this is the day of opportunity and day of salvation. You must accept Christ while it is today. So as we look at these verses in Matthew, I would say hear and heed the call. God is sovereign, he is in control, he is in charge. But we must constantly be encouraging, having the heartbeat that Christ had. How often I would have gathered you, but you wouldn't. Of Paul who said, I wish I could have been accursed for the sake of my kinsmen according to the flesh. Of Paul saying, has God abandoned them? Oh no. Paul says, I care for them that they might be redeemed. We need to have and share the burden of Christ for lost people who are dying around us that we can see in Christ even as he's weeping over Jerusalem. Let God figure out the other part that comes underneath the piece of paper. He already has it all figured out anyway. Maybe we'll understand it someday, maybe we won't. We need to leave that to him though and not rest in an assurance that, oh, because of this blank or whatever, we don't have to worry. No, we need to be burdened with the burden that Christ and Paul had for the salvation of those who are unsaved. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, I pray that as we would reflect upon Christ's words here and these words, how his heart was, in a sense, broken and burdened, yet this was all part of your plan and your will that the Gentiles would hear the gospel, yet there was a breaking of heart as Christ wanted them to be, to trust him. Father, I pray you'll give us a touch, a taste of that same longing for others to be saved, to trust you as their savior, to call upon you. So may we both hear and heed your call. If there's anyone here today that's never trusted Jesus Christ as his or her Lord and Savior, may that person not reject anymore, but hear and heed the call. And Father, may we be burdened to share the gospel with other people, sharing the burden of both Christ and Paul and the desire to, for the gospel to be brought and accepted by those who have heretofore rejected it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.